if you haven't seen the picture on Twitter, and then there's an accompanying article on UVA's uh, website, Kyle Guy came to town. Kyle Guy, as you know, big time baller for the Miami Heat now, tearing it up, being great. Uh, he they had a game in DC playing the Wizards, and he was able to, to come to town and have lunch with, spend the day with the coaching staff, Tony, uh, Jay Wheeler, Johnny Carpenter, all those guys. And um, really cool, man. Really cool to see him back in town. He said he hasn't been here since 2019. But one interesting thing that I found from the, from the article, and I had no idea, is the unwritten rule of NBA teams. And I quote from the great Jeff White's article here. Uh, I checked the score at halftime of the Heat and Wizards game, he said, and then I saw the highlights. It was a fantastic win. Alas for Guy, none of his Heat teammates played at Duke. There's an unwritten rule in the NBA that it's an automatic $100 bet whenever your college team plays a teammate's college team, Guy said. I was really looking forward to collecting my money. Just like when you're at work, I'm a Cowboys fan. When the Cowboys are playing the Steelers, one of my buddies is a Steelers fan. We always throw, you know, 10, 20 bucks on the game. Niners fan. Text your Niners friend, throw a bet on the game. So it was really cool to see that it's an unwritten rule and that he acknowledged it. So uh, awesome stuff. And now let's get to Georgia Tech. So Georgia Tech, uh, coached by coached by the uh, the man, the myth, the legend with the gigantic sideburns, Josh Pastner, had a really good season last year. Ended up having uh, the Player of the Year, uh, Moses Wright, Jose Alvarado. They had a really experienced team made it to the NCAA tournament they were a nine seed had a bunch of nice wins last year beat Q beat Duke um, Virginia beat them twice but this year it's a whole new squad a lot of guys are gone only some of the holdovers are Michael DeVoe uh, Jordan Usher uh, Dallin Coleman a freshman shooting 44.4 percent from the three-point line coming off he had 15 points in their loss to Miami this season, Georgia Tech has three wins in conference. They beat BC on the road. They beat Florida State at home at the time. It was a really, really big, it was a pretty good win. Florida State's kind of been a little bit shaky since then. Then they beat Clemson at home. Clemson's had a whole mess of a roller coaster season. Um, let's see uh, some of their other notable games here. Uh, lost to Tech by 15 on the road. Lost by 16 to Wake Forest at home. Lost by 23 to North Carolina on the road. Lost to Notre Dame in overtime. Lost by 12 to Duke. But yeah, three and nine in in conference play right now. Overall, they are 11th in scoring in the ACC, 69 points a game, and they're eighth in scoring defense, allowing 69 points a game. 11th in field goal percentage, and. Actually, a pretty good uh, three-point shooting team, 36.7% from beyond the arc. In terms of efficiency, their offense is way down the line. In Ken Palm, they're 233rd in efficiency. But on defense, they're actually top 100. Uh, they've allowed uh, teams to shoot 31.4% against them this year, which is 81st in the in the country. Uh, that Miami, the Miami game was actually tonight. I didn't realize. Uh, I was watching the Wake Forest North NC State game. Yeah, he actually took Miami laying the points and covered by one. So happy to see that. Uh, I knew, figured after losing to Virginia, the uh, Canes would come back and kind of have a bounce back win and beat up on a team they're supposed to supposed to beat up on. Georgia Tech is 155 in Ken Palm right now. They started the season at 54. So that's almost a, that's a 101 point fall from the beginning of the season. Those two big losses, like I mentioned, Moses Wright, Jose Alvarado have been, have been tough to, to swallow for them um 10 and 13 overall three and nine in conference they are seven and 14 7 14 and one against the spread this year um the only team worse than them is louisville and louisville and nc state are both worse than them for the record virginia is right on right in the middle there 12 and 12 uh georgia tech in the bpi is 137 five teams are below the 100 line in the bpi Louisville, NC State, Georgia Tech, Boston College, and Pittsburgh. So that's a little bit about the upcoming game per Ken Palm. They have uh, Virginia winning by nine points. That always pretty much lines up with what the spread is going to be. So 
in terms of prediction, I can see Virginia having a little bit of a letdown, to be quite honest with you, going from at Duke to home against the worst team in the league. But everyone's bought back in. I expect the Wahoo Nation to come out in full force. Uh, it is a four o'clock game on Saturday, the 12th. It's going to be on ESPN two. Definitely going to try and get over there. Hopefully y'all do too. Uh, keep your eyes peeled on Instagram. People are always giving tickets away. Uh, I might have a couple to, to throw around. If, if you're looking, hit me up, uh, but locker room access, uh, Wahoops two. those two are always tossing, tossing tickets out. Cause we just want people to be in the arena supporting the team. And it was kind of offensive to see the freaking the fans prep that Duke did, which is just crazy. And if you haven't seen it, go to the Wahoops Instagram page. It's like they prepare the fans prepare for the opposing team. And uh, it's crazy stuff. But they they said one and natty three years ago and their state they called it the stadium called it one and natty three years ago and their stadium's empty. And to be fair, it hasn't been packed this season at JPJ. So we need to get out there and, you know, show out for our boys but let me do a quick uh okay so just for instance they said they posted a a tweet from chase coleman back in the day where someone asked him what his dream school was and he said i don't know it used to be duke they called uh cody statman a, a washed up bo burnham they posted this old picture of poppy had a uh one of armand franklin's old tweets you know just shit that they can get on just stuff to trash talk uh yeah so before i go the acc tournament documentary the two-parter started on monday for the first two parts it was a little bit if, if you're not into like history it might have been a little bit slow it was like 55 to 67 my wife for instance was like <laughs> it was like watching you know a world war ii documentary or something but it was it was pretty cool some of the stuff that i found interesting uh definitely go check it out there's so much to watch it's a jonathan hawk documentary he did the unguarded thing on uh the unguarded film on espn about chris heron he did a, a ton of cool stuff he did through the fire i think back in the day with uh surviving advance that was a great acc uh documentary through the fire yeah sebastian telfair doc fastball the dominican dream really does a ton of college basketball and he's the perfect guy to be doing uh this project so it's 10 parts the first two parts aired already some of the takeaways I had from the first uh, two that aired, they first cut down nets in the ACC tournament. That was an ACC tournament thing. So, yeah, the coach, Everett Case, the NC State coach who started cutting down the nets, they said he had a, he had a background in Indiana and he, had, he was a big fan of tournament basketball. And that's how he kind of brought the idea into the ACC. And it was just cool to see that referred to as tournament basketball because I love tournament basketball. Like my favorite time of the year isn't even March Madness. It's the conference tournaments because there's literally games going on all day and everything is so meaningful because when there's a a bid on the line, it's like you're playing for your life. Uh, Good to see Dave Odom. And he was one of my favorite talking heads in the piece because he was just so passionate and you can tell how much it means to him. He was a Wake Forest assistant in the 70s also a, an assistant at UVA and then the head coach at, at Wake Forest for a while, but he grew up, he's from that area. He grew up right in North Carolina. And if you didn't know, his son was the head coach of the UMBC team that beat uh, UVA. And one thing I didn't understand, if you watch the documentary, everyone's wearing mad weird numbers. It's like 77, 84. I don't know why that dudes back in the fifties had to wear these Jersey numbers that were so odd. It's like football numbers as opposed to like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ooh, why, why are we going so high? Why are we going wide receiver? Huh? Um, the New York pipeline. That was really cool. I'm from New York. There's always been that pipeline of New York City to the south. The school I went to, the head coach of the basketball team, head coach at Western Carolina. A lot of the guys, I was at JUCO. A lot of the guys, we had a powerhouse basketball program. And a lot of the guys would go to uh programs down south afterwards to play their final two d1 years the buck freeman booze story how dean smith wound up at wound up at north carolina this monday coming up will be the second two parts i know that people are really going to start talking about it once it gets into the the ralph sampson years and the jordan stuff and duke's run and for us the kyle guy tony bennett one of those those solid years the next two coming up are 1966 to 72 
After a rough start, North Carolina's Dean Smith comes to be known for both dominance and dignity, playing a central role in desegregating the ACC with the recruitment of Charlie Scott. Scott is, the UN, is UNC's first African-American scholarship player and the star on some of Smith's greatest teams in the late 60s. That's episode three. Episode four is 93, is 73, 74. While the conference tournament is captivating many by the early 70s, it can be just as frustrating and even heartbreaking for great teams that don't win it and thus miss out on a chance to play in the NCAA tournament. An intense and high-impact rivalry develops between Maryland and NC State, capped by the finale of the 74 ACC tournament and arguably the greatest college basketball game ever and a battle that helped shape the future of the sport. I'm not even familiar with this, so I'm excited to see that. Um, episode 5 is 75 to 80. Episode 6 is 81 to 83. Oh, that's the, the Jordan year. Episode 7, 84 to 89. Um, episode 8, 90 to 97. Old Tim Duncan, Grand Hill. Episode 9, 98 to 2008. And then 2009 to 2020 is the final episode. And that's where we get a whole bunch of to uh, Tony Bennett. So thanks for checking us out as always. Please subscribe. You can subscribe right here on YouTube. Subscribe if you listen to the podcast on Spotify. We really appreciate that. Thank you.